There are many theories about the ancient history of dragon life on the planet Toril. One persistent one is that all draconic life forms arrived one day thanks to a massive meteor impact long ago called the Tear Fall, after the luminous tears of Saloon, the asteroid belt that appears to trail along sort of behind the moon of Toril at a slight angle. But there is plenty of evidence of them existing long before that, and here is where we get into the time before the true dragons arrived, and the proto-dragon species evolved into a number of different lineages. We're all familiar with the Wyvern, and the primitive fire drakes, but there was another humanoid offshoot which has been existing largely unchanged for many tens of thousands of years. I've seen lots of comments around the dragonborn of Abia that are now stranded on Toril being something of a recent and unwelcome invasion, but they are just the most recent draconic humanoid arrivals. The dragonkin had been on the planet for much longer and hail from a much earlier edition of the game. Second edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in fact, and yes they were deliberately written into the Forgotten Realm setting. It's just that they are very rarely seen on the continent of Faerun and are often just assumed to be half dragons. But they're also included in some source material for third edition D&D, not 3.5, so again they sort of slipped under the radar. But they also get some exposure in the pool of Radiance adventures and stories. So yes, sorry to say this for those who are of the opinion that Dragonborn don't belong in Toril, your opinion is just that. It does, really doesn't have a leg to stand on when it comes to the actual published lore, and it can't even be dismissed as some sort of recent corruption of the realm's lore. Draconic evolution just spontaneously produced a humanoid form without any help from magical mutations, corrupted dragon eggs, divine intervention, or any other factor. The dragonkin are native to the world of Toril, therefore as a bear is like a twin reflection of Toril, it is perfectly logical that there would be a version of their species found on that planet as well, located in its own parallel dimension. The easiest way to spot the difference between a half dragon and a dragonkin is their legs look like human legs, not the typical stifle and hock joints that are more like a dog or a horse leg you see with the half dragon and the kobolds. According to the original Monstrous Compendium Volume 1 published in 1994, these creatures are said to be very distant cousins of dragons, not directly derived from transformed true dragon eggs or the result of divine transformation of humanoid servants of the platinum dragon god named Bahamut, nor are they like the ogre version of kobolds. Dragonkin are a distinct race, similar in appearance to the Raconians of the world of Kryn, with fully functional wings and a long tail. They are a powerful and intimidatingly monstrous people. Adults range in height from a minimum of seven up to nine feet tall, so the largest champions of their kind go from being medium to large in their size category, and their strength is well beyond that of a human. They have a head that is unmistakably draconic, not just a more humanoid version of any existing true dragon breed, unlike the half dragon which clearly derives its features from their true dragon parent. Dragonkin have two short, swept back horns with a mane of hair growing from the head and down the neck, plus often some facial hair, usually only growing from below the chin, jutting out under their long snout. Dragonkin do not cut their hair and their taloned fingertips are not much good for braiding, so they often just decorate it with precious metal baubles. Their scaled hides range from dark yellow ochre to reddish brown with darker spots or bands. Their relatively small scales grow from hide as thick and tough as tanned leather, and their scales tend to become more sleek and burnished with age. Their body always has darker patterns on it, such as stripes or clusters of spots on the thighs, the base of the tail, their wide shoulders, and lighter spots patterning their leathery wings growing darker towards where the wings meet the shoulders becoming more prominent as they age. They have green wings that lighten to gold or yellow, or sometimes wings that match the colour of their bodies. Their long scaled tails are not useful in combat as a dragon's is, but their vicious claws most certainly are. A species as old as the Wyverns and the primitive fire drakes, they shared the supercontinent of Maroroboros with the savage humans, the rising might of the Saurian Saruk Empire, the furred Quagoth and the ancient Green Elves, and the precursors of the amphibian and avian races which would rise to dominate the world after the Saruk fell into decline. So, dragonkin culture is older than that of the Sun and Moon Elves, the Dwarves, the Gnomes, even the ancient lizard folk in Yonti. The dragonkin were just as numerous as all the other tribal species. They may even have wiped out a heap of species we have no idea even existed, and it probably is only their primitive humanoid rivals' abilities to cast simple magic and ride trained thunder beasts into battle that saved them from extinction under the talons of the powerful and cunning dragonkin. Back then, the humans just called them something else, but the basic meaning was dragon men. 
Dragonkin culture is basically eternal and unchanging. They have lived the same way for an amazingly long time and they are inherently hostile to any deviation from their traditional way of life, that of nomadic hunters and raiders with almost no interest in the goings on of other intelligent humanoid species outside of how their actions directly impact their own lives. Dragonkin witnessed the emergence of the true dragons and their whole era of dragon dominance across the face of Toril. They survived the sundering of the supercontinent and to this day can be found on all major land masses, including Katashaka and certainly in the unexplored expanse of the distant land called Ozzy, far, far to the east. The cult of the dragon has managed to gain control over a few dragonkin tribes. It imposes some small amount of discipline on their society in exchange for teaching the dragonkin additional combat skills and providing a steady supply of magical trinkets. They serve as warriors to protect the wide-ranging interests of the cult. Dragonkin are much better flyers than half-dragons. They will remain in the air and out of reach of melee attackers. They swoop down and unleash ripping, tearing strikes with their foreclaws. They don't have a fine sense of touch with their hands as a result of their digits being dominated by large claws. However, they have a formidable grip and are quite fond of making use of spears and pole arms manufactured by other races and provided to them. Their tribes don't manufacture such things. They are basically a culture of barbarians who live by raiding and exploiting resources until the tribe moves on to fresh hunting grounds. They tend to have a severe impact on local animal populations and edible plants. They also see no reason not to steal livestock and anything else they need. If another humanoid raises an objection, it's quite likely they will kill them and eat them just on principle. However, they do particularly like the taste of humanoids and swear that the smarter they are, the better they taste. They don't do this to intimidate or to sow terror. They simply don't care what other species think about the way they live. They have outlasted countless species already. They will outlive many, many more. Dragonkin do not apologize. They are easily provoked to deadly violence and they will do whatever it takes to get their claws on more magic items. See, Dragonkin have the innate ability to detect magic at will as a free action. They have an overpowering desire to acquire magic items and they attack characters who possess these items in preference to others. If possible, a Dragonkin will grab a magic item from its opponent and flee with it, taking the item back to its cave. Dragonkin who are fighting on the ground don't take unreasonable risks to flee with an item. They never turn their backs on an opponent, for example. Cult Dragonkin are better able to resist their instinctual desire for magic and do not endanger or abandon their mission for the sake of these items. Tribal dragonkin do not use magic items in combat, but cult dragonkin often do, if appropriate, and they have been instructed how to do so. There has been a subtle change as of late. For some reason, there are more and more dragonkin sorcerers showing up in their ranks, far more than have ever been since well before the Rage of Dragons began. And it seems like they are also growing their population numbers gradually, migrating their tribe's hunting grounds closer and closer to more civilized areas. You see, dragonkin can actually see magic emanations like it's a weird display of impossible colors that nobody else can fully appreciate. They have an overpowering desire to acquire magic items so they can take them back to their tribe and decorate every wall and surface with more and more of the shiny items. Dragonkin claws can cut a victim to ribbons fairly quickly and they brawl among themselves quite often within their tribes according to their own rules of hierarchy and prestige. They don't typically make use of manufactured weapons or armor unless they are taught how to and equipped with the such gear by other races. They always favor either a spear or a sturdy pole arm. They won't wear any armor that compromises their agility and speed in flight and they will not tolerate any other race getting involved in their own tribal politics. In the nation of Halrua, there are at least a few tribes who have inhabited the mountain range called the North Wall since before the arrival of the mages from Netheril, just prior to the disaster that brought that mighty empire to utter ruin. They had been a source of terror for the rustic farmers who struggled to survive in the rich and marshy delta for many years before the mages arrived and asserted complete control over the territory, destroying hordes of monsters and almost wiping out the native dragonkin. But, to their surprise, the dragonkin displayed wisdom and capitulated, agreeing to cease their raids on the civilized races of Halrua and instead provide added security all along the mountains bordering the wilderness infested by serpent folk, feral elves and goblinoids. In time, with better understanding, it became clear that this is simply the natural instinct of the dragonkin to always follow the strongest, and it was the Netherese mage's impressive ability to not just defeat the many dragons layering along the mountain chain, but bend them to the will and actually ride them like trained mounts. If you ride a dragon into a camp of dragonkin, you won't have any problems with them, but the moment they consider you weaker than them, you are probably going to get yourself killed and eaten. 
The people of Halrua understand this very well, and they never, never drop their guard or completely trust the Dragonkin, even those they've known well for many years. Dragonkin are led by the strongest. If their leader becomes incapacitated from illness or injury, they are disposed of. And if a stronger individual comes along and defeats their leader, that individual becomes the new leader. It's that simple. And Dragonkin consider any other social hierarchy to be corrupted and contemptible. Naturally, this means that powerful mages, warlords, and true dragons have found Dragonkin to be useful many over the eons, and you never know where the dragonkin will show up, the very model of barbarian ideals. If you think of the Klingons from Star Trek, but just way, way more so, that is the dragonkin almost exactly. Just throw a heavy preference for eating other intelligent humanoids. And no, the mages of Halrua have never tried to curb that part of their culture. I mean, if you were an evil overlord, having excellent flying scouts who could also neatly dispose of any pesky prisoners and leave no remains behind is quite handy. Evil, sure, but very convenient. But you know the old griffin breeder saying, if you keep hand feeding a man eater, sooner or later you're going to lose an arm. Dragonkin proudly wear humanoid skulls and prefer to wear clothing made from cured humanoid leather. If you happen to have a dragonkin staring at your artistic tattoos, they are absolutely considering how nice your skin would look on them as a new kilt or some such. And if you happen to visit their village, don't look too closely at the decorative patterns on the walls of their tents. Aside from their respect for strength, they have no regard for others and simply take whatever they want from those weaker than themselves. They have no natural predators, but in many places they are hunted by civilized races for a standing bounty on their heads. Despite their preference for meat, they can eat damn near anything they can chew, and it's most likely that the grey orcs from the far north learned how to survive on the ripple bark fungus thanks to watching what the dragonkin were eating. Dragonkin have no interest in treasure. If you want to get them to do something for you, offer them enchanted items of any kind. It's the only thing they consider valuable other than fresh meat. Also, if you do find yourself in a fight with them, targeting them in the air with whatever ranged weapons you have, they have a distinct tactical failing in that regard as they have never and will never learn to either use or defend themselves from such weaponry. Don't engage them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They will simply snatch the weapons from your grip and then rip your guts out, quite literally. A clear sign they've been involved in a battle is loads of victims with their entrails flung all over the place and the skin flayed from their body. If they have an abundance of freshly killed humanoids, they simply remove the heads as they find roasted brains to be the most delicious delicacy, hence why they favour eating the most intelligent humanoids. Nice, big, rich and fatty brains to eat. They hatch from communal clusters of eggs, quite tiny compared to humanoid babies, but also quite independent and developed from a very early age and grow rapidly on such a rich and nutritious diet, reaching maturity by the age of around eight or so. So they have a biological reason for eating brains. They also have a lifespan probably up to 200 years old, but very rarely survive that long. As soon as they start to suffer age-related frailty, they will most likely be killed by their own tribe. Trying to teach one anything other than a better way to fight with a weapon is basically pointless. They have the same level of intelligence as an average human, but they simply won't learn to read and ignore anything that is not of immediate use in the here and now. Technically, their own language is draconic, but their wealth of dialects uh, are much more sibilant and simple compared to the language of the dragons. They can understand essentially what each other are saying, but to human ears, they sound like they're speaking different languages. They can learn some words in common, but have a lot of difficulty actually speaking the language, slipping back into their own tongue and often using hand gestures or simply pointing and hissing to get their meaning across. Another reason why it's so damn hard to teach them anything at all. If they have a rich oral history of their people, nobody's ever heard it, so it's most likely that they don't, which is a great shame considering the amazing span of time that they've lived and witnessed life and major events from history on the planet of Toril. Kobolds avoid dragonkin. They revere dragons, yes, but they are far from stupid and getting close to a dragonkin is just going to get them killed and eaten. Even so, they can be found in the same dragon lair serving their master. The dragonkin come and go as they please. The kobolds fetch them food and try to stay the hell out of their way. The winged kobold urds are even more so. Dragonkin reserve a special kind of hatred for noble dragonborn and have some very derogatory names for them which focus on their lack of wings and tail, their ugly flat faces and mimicry of weakling humanoid society. I'd be very interested in seeing how they would react to the draconians of Kryn. My name is AJ Pickett, I make videos like this, researching and presenting the incredible rich lore of Dungeons and Dragons, the Forgotten Realms campaign setting and the rest of the D&D multiverse. As always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.